As far as lumbar spine, anatomy, x-ray anatomy, so you see some DDD or degenerative disc disease right here, down here as well, but not bad in alignment. Uh, these are things that are important on this AP or anterior posterior view. These are called pedicles. They look like owl's eyes. There's the beak of the owl, kind of the eyes, square-headed ears. So you guys see that? Yes. All right. So that's where the pedicle screws go, and which we'll show you that in, in, in the lab as well, where we've kind of transitioned to using more of this plate construct that uh, allows us to use to make a much smaller incision, uh, less tra trauma to the soft tissues, and patients kind of heal up faster, not as much of a recovery or as much pain. Uh, this is a sort of cross-section view again. This is the nerves anterior down here, posterior is here, so somebody's face down. This sinuvertebral nerve, okay, is a pretty important nerve to the back wall of the disc. That's where your pain comes from when you tear a disc, rupture a disc, throw out a disc, or slip a disc, those types of things, because that nerve gets aggravated by this stretching phenomenon with the back wall of the disc. So it's pretty uncomfortable, to say the least. And that's actually the nerve root. And this, for you guys, when you guys know, you guys heard of medial branch blocks or radio frequency ablation, that's that branch right there, okay? And it's right on the outside of the facet joint. So that's where they'll numb this up, see if it fixes their pain or helps them. Then they'll put a probe in here and burn that nerve. Okay, so it desensitizes basically that, that uh, facet joint, all right? So serve the answer, appropriate indications are met, appropriate conservative measures have been tried, but this is really important, okay? It has to look like a duck, walk like a duck, talk like a duck, and look like a duck to the person looking at them for it to be a duck. What I mean by that is you got to have a lot of stuff adding up. If you have any of these things out of, out of place, like the image doesn't match up with the patient's finding, like the distribution of nerve root symptoms doesn't match up with their MRI findings, or on your exam, their complaints don't, don't add up to your findings, surgery needs to get off the radar, okay, because the chances of failure really start going up astronomically. It really has to have, particularly for the lumbar spine, uh, just because it's a lot of weight bearing going through that area, there's a lot of forces and responsibilities. A lot of, a lot, and many of the times, particularly with herniated discs, you don't need to do anything surgically. This is a herniation three months later. You guys see that? That's the same patient three months later. It's just gone. The body comes in, dissolves this thing, gets rid of it. He's got a new one up here, but that's okay. <laughs> it's not work related at that point. Totally different level. Don't worry about that. I got nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. You're fine. You're good. All right. Same thing here. Disc herniation gone. Okay. So three months, pretty good time frame. If it's still there, three months later, chances of it going away on its own really drop off a cliff. So those are patients who probably need to have something done surgically because you can do injections, you can do therapy more. It's just going to prolong the, their their treatment and drag out their case. And, Disc herniation, it's a little laminotomy over here. So it's a little keyhole we make in the bone, clean out the piece of disc, pushing on the nerve, take out the piece of disc, and that's basically what the surgery is. It's outpatient, takes about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, but routinely be done outpatient. There's really no reason to have inpatient discectomies unless they're really, really sick. There's something else going on. Uh, so the pedicle screw thing, right? So this is that same view. The pedicle is this bridge of bone between the posterior elements or the spinous process, facets, transverse processes, and a junction to the vertebral body. That's called the pedicle, and that's where the screws go. That's the sort of the X marks the spot place to go through it on the anatomy. So it's typically this facet joint. It's the bottom outer corner. That's our starting point routinely. So those the facet joints are, are over the disc spaces. So the bottom outer corner is right here, and then you medialize the screw or kind of go toward the midline, okay? Kind of like you see here, okay? That's a frozen section that they did as a cryotome. It's a pretty interesting picture, and then you see multiple levels there. But that's what a pedal screw looks like, okay? All right, this is the newer technology, which is that plate that you just saw. I think this is going to work. So this is a way to put that intervertebral spacer that I passed around is done through a, like, a little tube uh, retractor to protect the nerve roots in the surrounding area. So we typically fill that with the patient's bone, provide stability and spacing out of that intervertebral disc, that's what it looks like, expands to dig into the end plates a little bit better for stability. And then we fill that with bone graft, and this is how we do it. It's very similar to this, actually. So all that bone graft we use in the cervical spine, we get that from the lumbar spine, too, where we're cleaning up bone spurs, and then we're able to push it through the central aperture or, or cannula of this <coughs> implant to have bone graft come out the sides and it fills the intrabody space then with the patient's own bone, most of it anyways. So it's a really nice way to, to get 
autographed and through smaller apertures and smaller approaches so patients don't have as much tissue trauma. Like I said, we're doing this as outpatient. Patients can get home and do relatively well. Sometimes we'll use cadaver chips, bone chips. Sometimes structural pieces, depending on if they have, you know, kind of a big space that looks like it's a little unstable. Usually it's not, but it's just options that we have available to us if we need them. Yeah, little bone croutons is what they are. So we mix that with... So when we rough up those bones, and right when that bone starts bleeding, it has a lot of stem cells that come out right at the beginning. After a while, it kind of get washed out, and it's just blood that's coming out. So we want to collect that bleeding bone blood uh, initially. So we have a little suction device that collects in a little canister. Um, then we mix that with the bone chips if we need it. All right, so we get kind of the benefit of having the patient stem cells in that bone as well to help the healing process. All right. This is some other this is, uh, animation of the posterior plate. So that was the inner body cage. So that's a bigger version of the plate, but it, it moves in multiple directions. We have a little, whoops. Hit the wrong button. See if this works again. That's the button I'm looking for. So these little foot plates also articulate inside, inside the plate itself. So it has a lot of, uh, basically, a lot of adaptation built into it to the patient's anatomy, so it can conform to the patient's anatomy depending on what it is. Some patients have thinner spinous processes, some have bigger depending on the size of the patient. And that sort of clamps the two spinous processes together. And you'll see that here in a second. So the cage in the front, and then see how that goes on the spinous processes then? And clamps in, so we don't have to put, make a much bigger incision to get screws in. We can do this through a much smaller incision and give us the same, particularly with this implant because it's threaded. It really forms a very, um, sort of interference fit with the end plates by digging into the end plates to make some, uh, a good stable interface. All right, what I talked about, so why patients don't do well with surgery? Wrong patient, all right? The patient's got a lot of other issues going on. Uh, you're not good candidates for for multiple reasons, whether they've got other, uh, if it's, you know, heart conditions, if it's kidney conditions, you know, if their complaints are all subjective, there's nothing objective on the imaging studies, you got to think twice, okay? Think about what else going on. Wrong diagnosis, I mean, multiple things. They could have bursitis on the lateral side of their hip and not even be their back. It could be the SI joint. It could be a pinched nerve in the front of their pelvis. It could be a, an extremity problem. A lot of times we'll see patients with groin pain. It's actually their hip. So you really need to get, do a good job of making sure you nail down what the diagnosis is, which is probably one of the biggest things we typically see is, is uh, not, not properly diagnosed. Wrong level, that's where patients' leg symptoms don't match up at all with the nerve root. So if it's L5, it's down the lateral outside of your leg all the way to the top of your foot. If they've got pain that comes into the groin and down the middle five, but their find, findings are at L4-5 or L5-S1, it, it doesn't match up. There's just, there's just no way. That's not causing that. It's just not, not going to happen. So you don't want to be operating on something you see. So don't treat the picture. you got to make sure you got the right all those right parameters in place. Okay, Wrong procedure. Does the patient need a fusion? Usually not, Okay, unless they have instability. There's just this mantra out there. If I'm decompressing, I'm fusing. Most patients don't need a fusion. Okay, you need to get the pressure off the nerve, fix the problem, leave the spine alone. Less is more. Get in, get out. All right, fix what you need to fix. Don't try to make pretty pictures like this. You can fuse all these levels. I mean, this is a good disc, good disc, and this is bad, bad, bad. So now this patient's going to have what a four-level fusion. They're not going to do well. It's just it's too much fusion for the back. It's not going to move very well. Uh, unless it's catastrophic, like a motor vehicle accident, dislocation, instability, you don't need to be doing that. It's just that's, I mean, I, the number of more than one level fusions I do is maybe 4%, 5%, not even that probably. Um, the vast majority of fusions are going to be one level, and the reason for that is it's a recurrent disc herniation, usually the third time, or they have instability. So, wrong surgeon. You know the old, ad old adage that you ever heard of, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Right, so I do fusions, that's what I do. You, everybody needs fusion, because that's what I know how to do. Right? That's what I learned in, uh, in training. My mentor and uh, trainer in, uh, in New York was, you gotta have a huge toolbox, because you gotta fit your toolbox to the patient, and vice versa. And the more tools you have, the more procedures and, and uh, 
approaches you can provide, getting to the problem to give the patient the best outcome, the least amount of morbidity or injury from surgery is what you do. Because you don't know how to do the procedure means you shouldn't be doing it. All right, somebody else should be doing it, or you need to learn how to do it. That seems really big on that. Again, don't treat pictures, like I was mentioning. Uh, less is usually more. I already said that. I'm like clairvoyant here. It's like I know this talk. Failure of conservative care alone is not an indication for surgery, okay? Surgery is not a de facto answer. This didn't work. Surgery is the answer. No matter what, if it didn't work, we're doing surgery. No, patients are not going to get better with surgery a lot of times because it's not something that is surgically amenable to improvement, all right? So if they have arthritic back pains, older patient, and we see them all the time, they're like, can't you just fix this? Uh, no. The answer is no, you can't. I can't make you 20 years old again. You know, we have, and unfortunately, the patients are in pain. I get it. They're 70, 80 years old. You know, patients have pain or they have arthritic backs because they worked in, you know, boiler making for 30 years or they're, you know, iron workers or construction and, you know, working in the mills, shoveling coal. For 20, their backs are a disaster. Or, you know, truckers that have been flatbedding, lifting tarps, chains, and all that stuff. It wears you out. It causes problems. I can't undo that. I can have you go to surgery, you're going to be maybe as good as when you went in, probably worse. So it's not like I'm going to get you any benefits. A lot of risk with very little, if any, reward all right, for the patient. So.